The final decades of the 1800s found much of Europe in a losing battle with overpopulation. Many people felt that their only hope for survival was to immigrate to the United States of America. So they packed up and headed for the New World, with most of them arriving at the Ellis Island Immigration Station in the center of New York Harbor. For over 50 years, starting in 1892, Ellis was the primary immigration center for the United States. During the peak years, 1900 to 1924, some 12 million people came through the facility. They were common people who made an uncommon decision. They wanted to be free, free of the poverty, free of the persecution, and free of the despair that dominated their lives in the countries in which they had been living. They packed up what they could carry and headed for the land of opportunity. They changed their lives, but they also changed the United States. The author Patrick Gallo quotes an immigrant as saying when he got to New York, he learned three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, most of the streets were not paved. And third, he was expected to pave them. In addition to becoming America's labor force, the immigrants also became a force for creativity, culture, and gastronomic diversity. There is no country in the world that offers a greater selection of culture, commerce, or cuisine. To a great extent, it was the immigrants who traveled to this island that brought us what the world thinks of as traditionally American. So please join me, Bert Wolf, for Travels and Traditions from Ellis Island. The steamship company saw the immigrants as profitable cargo. They put up posters about the United States all over Europe. Agents went from house to house telling people about the promised land. Catch the next boat and sail off to wealth beyond your wildest dreams. They were perfect cargo for the shipping companies, cargo that actually loaded itself. They traveled in a class of service called steerage because the part of the boat where this human cargo was stored was the place that held the steering equipment. Packed together in appalling conditions that were breeding grounds for disease, thousands of people died during the voyages. But for those who survived, there was a chance to make a new life. The ship docked alongside the piers that lined Manhattan shore. If you were a first or second class passenger, officials from the US Immigration Service would clear you while you were on board, and you were free to go. But if you had come over in steerage, you were loaded onto ferries and taken across New York Harbor to Ellis Island. The staff at Ellis was charged with the responsibility of making sure that no one was granted entrance to the U.S. who had a contagious disease or who could not earn a living and might thereby become a burden to the government. These days, the people arriving on the island are tourists who want to understand the past. Harry Marino is an Ellis Island librarian who took me on a tour. This is where the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service brought the aliens, the immigrants, uh, to Ellis Island aboard barges. What they would do is they would uh, bring them from the steamships. And the barges were coming all day long and they would dock here. Then the immigrants would come out and directed by men called groupers, they would form two lines. One line for men and, the, and uh, boys and the other line for women and, and girls and other children. So then they would continue into this main building at Ellis Island. This is the registry room. This was the place in which the fate of the immigrant was decided by an inspector. And the inspector was assisted by an interpreter in case the load of, the shipload of immigrants were non-English speakers. And there was always a clerk at the inspector's side. At those desks? That's correct. The inspector was really looking for ways of keeping the immigrant out of the country weeding out the alien, that was the idea. You had to find out whether someone violated the laws in advance of entry. They would find out, does the immigrant have enough money? Is the immigrant a criminal? Is the does the immigrant suffer from some contagious disease or immoral disease, or is he handicapped in some way that would prevent him making a living? I understand that some people came here with money. Yes, actually a good many did. You Why? Know, um, Why would they come if they had money? <laughs> well, they wanted to, to invest in this country, to buy land and settle down here, buy shops and go into business. And that was the, the way to do it. You were frugal, you saved your money, and then you came to America. And if they got through, 
What happened next? Well, if they actually passed through, then the next question was uh, how soon they could, could they get off of Ellis Island? <laughs> because people didn't really like Ellis Island. How soon could they get out? Uh, usually within, within an hour or so, usually. Uh, usually there was a boat waiting. They were free, they would go down the stairs of separation, the, the, separate, the separator that led them to the boat dock or the railroad dock, whether to proceed to New York or to proceed, like most of them did, across the country. The registry room was the primary inspection area. In 1909, my grandmother came through here holding her one-year-old daughter in her arms, my mother. This was also the place where most immigrants got their first taste of American food. There were soups and stews, breads, fresh fruits, and for some reason, an enormous amount of stewed fruit, particularly prunes. Breakfast offered coffee and bread and butter and crackers and milk, but for some reason, the crackers and milk were only for women and children. Dinner was beef stew, potatoes, and rye bread. In comparison to what most of the immigrants had been eating on the voyage over, Ellis was a gastronomic paradise. My grandmother's meal on Ellis turned out to be a disaster. Her very first bite sent her into tears, and she was afraid that she and her infant daughter would starve to death. That bite was of a fruit she had never seen before, a banana. Problem was, nobody told her she had to peel it before she ate it. In spite of the fact that Ellis Island was processing twice as many people as it was designed to handle, the staff did a remarkable job. Medical exams were completed, stability interviews conducted, there was a place to change your old country money into U.S. dollars, and a spot to buy railroad tickets if you were going on to some other part of the country. If you were staying in the neighborhood, you went through a door marked Push to New York. On the other side was a ferry that would take you the last mile of your journey to Manhattan. Over 100 million Americans trace their heritage to someone who came through Ellis Island. And much of what we think of as traditionally American in business, culture, and food came through here. In the beginning, most of the cultural and gastronomic influences were from the English. After all, we speak English, our laws are based on English common law, and much of the cooking was based on English recipes. As immigrant groups arrived, they wanted to assimilate and be like everybody who was here, and so they accepted the English tradition. There was, however, one group of people who thought we needed a little cultural help and that the cooking was absolutely terrible. They flatly refused to give up their old country ways, and I think changed America in many ways more than we changed them. And those were the Italians. The key decade for the Italians was the 1880s. A conflict was developing between the Italian immigrants arriving in New York and the scientific community. Researchers were developing theories about the relationship of what people ate and drank to their overall well-being. They were also teaching these theories as if they were scientific facts. The scientists had some interesting ideas. They thought that the tomato was poisonous and could kill you. They thought that fruits and vegetables had so much water in them that from a nutritional point of view, they were useless. They thought that green vegetables were the worst of all. They thought garlic was so dangerous, it was like a self-inflicted wound. They were very nervous about eating different foods at the same time. If you put meatloaf and mashed potatoes and mixed vegetables on the same plate and ate them at the same time, it might put too much stress on your digestive system and you'd get sick. Ludicrous stuff. Imagine a family coming to New York from Italy and the government tells them that everything they love and have been eating for generations is no good for them. Outrageous. Fortunately, they stood their ground and were lucky they did. It's easy to credit Italian immigrants for America's love of pizza and pasta, but they're also responsible for the widespread acceptance of fruits and vegetables. This is the Fairway Market on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And it's easy to see what the Italians brought in. Bins of fresh pasta, shelves of dried pasta, a wall of olive oils, tubs of fresh olives, tomatoes, artichokes, broccoli, baby eggplants, a dozen different espresso coffees, and biscotti, and that's just the easy stuff. Steve Jenkins is in charge of Fairway's cheese department, 
And he has his own story. At this counter, there's probably some 400 cheeses. But I'd say, uh, uh, France aside, the majority of them are Italian. We started in the northwest corner of Italy, where there's one of the five greatest cheeses in the whole world that's called Fontina d'Aosta, from Aosta. The great semi-soft raw cow's cheese from near Mount Fonti, the greatest melting cheese in the world. And from there, we just fell across the Piemonte border and discovered that the great Paglia cheeses and the Toma cheeses and Bra, the great, great cow's milk cheeses of Piemonte, in addition, the goat's milk Roccaverano and the sheep's milk Murazzano. And now they're sort of, they're staples. They're things our customers absolutely have to have. Uh, from Piemonte, we travel west into, into uh, uh, Lombardia where we discovered great mascarpone. From there, we went into Tuscany and pioneered what I think is my favorite cheese in the world, which is Pecorino Toscano, name controlled, sheep's milk cheese from Tuscany. Comes in a variety of sizes and shapes and ages. It's always raw milk. It's uh, one of the most satisfying cheeses I know. And into Campania, we bring in mozzarella di bufala, which since the second century AD has been the definitive mozzarella, not cow's milk. They don't even call cow's milk mozzarella, uh, they call it fior di latte. That's Campania, that's the area that's all around Napoli. We make sure we've got them every day and they sell in ever increasing amounts and it's an enormous source of pride. For centuries, the idea of good eating meant meat and fat. And in the early 1900s, researchers discovered vitamins and dietary minerals, and all the rules changed. Suddenly, fruits and vegetables became good foods. The Italians also brought in America's favorite dessert. The Chinese had been making something like ice cream for about 5,000 years. But it was the Italians who introduced ice cream to Europe and eventually to the general public in North America. The ancient Romans loved ice cream. They would send a runner into the mountains to get ice, bring it back to town, mix it with crushed fruit and cream, and end up with something like what we have today. Ice cream followed a rather rocky road in ancient Rome. If you came back from the mountains and your ice was melted, the emperor might just feed you to the lions. Things were better in colonial America. George Washington had his own ice cream making machine, and Thomas Jefferson had his own recipe for French vanilla. But it took the immigrants from Italy to make ice cream what it is today. Yummy. And it was the Italian immigrant community that developed much of the American wine business. Many of the great vineyards in California were started by Italian farm families that came to the United States at the end of the 1800s. Edward T. O'Donnell is an urban and ethnic historian. He stopped into New York's Park Avenue Cafe to talk about the immigrant contribution to American culture. Well, the Italians brought with them, first and foremost, themselves, uh, by the millions. And one of their most obvious contributions to America well, were the millions of people that filled the factories and the work sites that built the roads and, and produced the great uh, abundance of the American economy in the early 20th century. These are mostly nameless, faceless people that uh, we don't know anything about, except that they were Italian and that they, they came to America. But among the millions, there certainly are many very notable ones that, that do stand up. Probably one of the best examples being Marconi, uh, who invented the wireless set and eventually founded the company that becomes RCA, one of the biggest and most important corporations in the, in the 20th century. Uh, Enrico Fermi uh, won the Nobel Prize for his research in nuclear science. Uh, you could shift to the arts and look at people like Enrico Caruso, probably the most popular entertainer in the early 20th century, uh, into areas like baseball. New Yorkers would certainly argue, and I think a lot of other baseball fans would agree, that Joe DiMaggio is one of the great uh, baseball players of all time. Yogi Berra, certainly a, another great one. You could shift to Hollywood and see that Frank Capra, the man who brought such great movies like It's a Wonderful Life to the silver screen, certainly were uh, key figures in the heyday of Hollywood. So you have both lots of nameless, faceless people who made their contribution and then certainly notable ones that stand out. In terms of numbers, the largest group to come through Ellis Island were the Italians. The second largest group were the Irish. But the Irish opened the place for business. On New Year's Day of 1892, a 15-year-old girl named Annie Moore became the first immigrant to pass through the government station on Ellis. She'd come from County Cork in Ireland. Annie Moore was welcomed to her new country by millions of Irish men and women who had come here during the 1800s to avoid the famine 
that was caused by the repeated failure of the potato crop. Potatoes had become a basic part of virtually every meal in the Irish peasant home. When the Irish arrived in North America, they immediately planted potatoes and single-handedly made them as popular as they are today. Now, the, the Irish, uh, of course, have been coming uh, for, since the colonial period, but their biggest wave was certainly in the 19th century. And their contribution, one of their biggest contributions, was that they arrived in such huge numbers and really shocked America. Uh, forced America to really think about what it meant to be an American. And by being mostly poor from a, a Ireland and a Catholic for the most part, they forced America really to rethink uh, what it meant to be American and kind of expanded the definition. America was not particularly pleased with the arrival of the Irish and gradually, over time, took a couple generations, accepted them as Americans. I mean, you could look at something like the St. Patrick's Day Parade that is held all across the country now every year on March 17th. It's a celebration of Irish identity, but it's been copied and uh, replicated by every immigrant group since. Other contributions by the Irish, probably the most evident one, is in the role that they played in building the American economy uh, as laborers. They came with very few skills, with almost no money for the most part, and they arrived, but they did arrive with the need to work and the willingness to work. And if you look across America, the the great infrastructure that was built that made America the greatest economy in the world by the early 20th century, the railroads, the canals, uh, the great uh, projects like the Brooklyn Bridge, all were built overwhelmingly uh, with Irish labor, many other groups too, but Irish really were the, were the key uh, contributors to that uh, development. Another major group came from Eastern Europe, Russia, Poland, Hungary, Austria, and Romania. As the 1880s came to a close, Eastern Europe found itself in constant turmoil. Crops were failing, there was agonizing poverty throughout the population, and religious persecution was rampant. During a 50-year period, starting in 1875, over two million Russians took passage to New York, and by 1914, two and a half million Poles had passed through Ellis. The heyday of Eastern European arrival to America, mostly Jewish, was at the turn of the century, and they were the ones most closely associated with Ellis Island. Uh, they come by the millions, largely due to factors in Eastern Europe, persecution, war, famine, and general overpopulation. And they arrive in America at this time, usually going through Ellis Island, and fill American cities. They're very urban people. And they, like all the immigrants before them, make a tremendous mark. Think about the, the Jewish contribution uh, to the arts. People like uh, everything went from uh, Irving Berlin to uh, the Gershwins. Go back a little bit for earlier, late 19th century, early 20th century, vaudeville was probably the most popular form of uh, entertainment in America, and it's overwhelmingly uh, marked or full of, of Jewish entertainers. The Marx Brothers were originally a, a vaudeville uh, routine. When you talk about the foods of Russia, you're actually talking about the food of more than 170 different ethnic groups, each clinging to their own individual habits. They all loved rich whole grain breads, which were much healthier than the overly processed white breads eaten by most Americans. They chose water as their favorite drink and liked to have it infused with bubbles. They were responsible for the development of the New York seltzer business. They called it the worker champagne. They were masters at smoking fish and meat and introduced pastrami to East Coast delicatessens. They also did a lot to repopularize the drinking of tea, which is now almost as popular as it was before the Boston Tea Party. The third largest immigrant group to pass through Ellis were the Germans. The Germans have been coming to America since the earliest colonial days, and in fact, Ben Franklin was writing about them in the 1750s as, as a big problem, something that uh, we ought to reconsider uh, how many we should allow in, because they weren't learning the language, they were printing government documents in their own language, they were kids were learning German in public schools, and that really we were going to be Germanized if we didn't stop this, uh, this influx. That's in the 1750s. So Germans have been here uh, for a very long, long time. I think Franklin eventually got over that, uh, that sentiment. But the great wave of German immigration is the 19th century, and by many measures they are the largest group to come to America. Uh, and they are arrived principally to American cities, both in the East and in the Midwest. A tremendous number of Germans come as carpenters and cabinet builders. Uh, probably the most famous German family in the 19th century are the Steinways. And they arrive as cabinet makers, and they realize that there's probably a good living to be made building cabinets and making fine 
uh, wood products, but the founder of the Steinway family realizes that there's real money to be made if he takes those skills and transforms them into piano making. Make an in, he's essentially the Henry Ford of piano making. Make the luxury item of the piano affordable to the masses. Well, Germans, some of their food is still very important to America. Um, other traditions, if we think about kindergarten, it's a German word, and it's a, a German cultural contribution to America. The Germans believed in education, especially at a young age, and they established kindergartens, and eventually when American public education began to evolve, they simply borrowed the word to describe uh, early childhood education. Much of the American Christmas is a German, uh, of German influence, or certainly influenced by the German migration. Uh, the Christmas tree is certainly a northern European tradition that Germans brought to America, the idea of cutting down a tree, putting it in the house, and decorating it. Um, even our image of Santa Claus. Thomas Nast, who was a famous political cartoonist in the 1860s and 70s, and uh, developed everything from the image of the Republican Party, the, the, the elephant, and the Democratic Party, the, the donkey, which were cartoon images, but also every year for Harper's Weekly, he drew a picture of Santa Claus for their Christmas cover. And it was that image uh, that gives us all the things we think about when we think about Santa Claus. A life-size figure, Santa Claus had often been depicted as a small elf, um, a person who checks the list, makes his list of naughty and nice. That's a, that's a Thomas Nast contribution, and Nast was born in Germany. Gastronomically, the Germans introduced recipes that became as American as apple pie. Hamburgers, frankfurters, potato salad, and jelly donuts were once specialties in the German immigrant kitchen. They were also master bakers and beer brewers. Budweiser, Coors, Miller, all started by German immigrants. And next time you put ketchup on your hamburger, please bear in mind that H.J. Heinz came from a German immigrant family. There's one more immigrant I want to tell you about. Peter Zenger, who came here from Germany in 1709 and worked on New York's first newspaper, the Gazette. The Gazette was always being censored by the government, and so Zenger quit and started his own paper, in which he constantly attacked the dishonest governor. The governor sued him for libel, and Andrew Hamilton defended Zenger. Hamilton said that the paper had the right to say whatever it wanted about the government as long as it was true. The jury agreed and set the tone for freedom of the press in the United States. And without it, I couldn't say many of the things that I say on this program. And speaking of programs, I hope you've enjoyed this one and that you will join us next time on Travels and Traditions. I'm Bert Wolf. You can watch this program and link to hundreds of other Bert Wolf programs free at BertWolf.com. There's information on how to tour the same places, plus Bert's slightly irreverent take on history and culture. It's all at BertWolf.com. The final decades of the 1800s found much of Europe in a losing battle with overpopulation. Many people felt that their only hope for survival was to immigrate to the United States of America. So they packed up and headed for the New World, with most of them arriving at the Ellis Island Immigration Station in the center of New York Harbor. For over 50 years, starting in 1892, Ellis was the primary immigration center for the United States. During the peak years, 1900 to 1924, some 12 million people came through the facility. They were common people who made an uncommon decision. They wanted to be free, free of the poverty, free of the persecution, and free of the despair that dominated their lives in the countries in which they had been living. They packed up what they could carry and headed for the land of opportunity. They changed their lives, but they also changed the United States. The author Patrick Gallo quotes an immigrant as saying when he got to New York, he learned three things. First, the streets were not paved with gold. Second, most of the streets were not paved. And third, he was expected to pave them. In addition to becoming America's labor force, the immigrants also became a force for creativity, culture, and gastronomic diversity. There is no country in the world that offers a greater selection of culture, commerce, or cuisine. To a great extent, it was the immigrants who traveled to this island that brought us what the world thinks of as traditionally American. So please join me, Bert Wolf, for travels and traditions from Ellis Island. The ships docked alongside the piers that lined Manhattan shore. 
If you were a first or second class passenger, officials from the U.S. Immigration Service would clear you while you were on board, and you were free to go. But if you had come over in steerage, you were loaded onto ferries and taken across New York Harbor to Ellis Island. The staff at Ellis was charged with the responsibility of making sure that no one was granted entrance to the U.S. who had a contagious disease or who could not earn a living and might thereby become a burden to the government. These days, the people arriving on the island are tourists who want to understand the past. Harry Marino is an Ellis Island librarian who took me on a tour. This is where the uh, Immigration and Naturalization Service brought the aliens, the immigrants, uh, to Ellis Island aboard barges. What the steamship companies saw the immigrants as profitable cargo. They put up posters about the United States all over Europe. Agents went from house to house telling people about the promised land. Catch the next boat and sail off to wealth beyond your wildest dreams. They were perfect cargo for the shipping companies, cargo that actually loaded itself. They traveled in a class of service called steerage because the part of the boat where this human cargo was stored was the place that held the steering equipment. Packed together in appalling conditions that were breeding grounds for disease, thousands of people died during the voyages. But for those who survived, there was a chance to make a new life. What they would do is they would uh, bring them from the steamships. And the barges were coming all day long, and they would dock here. Then the immigrants would come out, and directed by men called groupers, they would form two lines. One line for men and, the, and uh, boys, and the other line for women and, and girls and other children. So then they would continue into this main building at Ellis Island. This is the registry room. This was the place in which the fate of the immigrant was decided by an inspector. And the inspector was assisted by an interpreter in case the load of the shipload of immigrants were non-English speakers. And there was always a clerk at the inspector's side. At those desks. That's correct. The inspector was really looking for ways of keeping the immigrant out of the country weeding out the alien, that was the idea. You had to find out